Welcome to this episode of the BIM Tube podcast. So today I've got Ian Miskinnon, who uh, I've known for several years. So welcome, Ian. Thank you for joining me. Thank you very much for the invite. Looking forward to this. Great. Yeah, me too. So and it's been a, a few um, weeks or so in the making. I was finally getting together as well because we're both very busy people. So thanks for making the time. No worry. Um, and as we obviously had a little chat before, and I've also briefed you that and again, this is for people who are maybe just watching this one for the first time. The whole premise is that we talk about topics like digital data, maybe even things like BIM, who knows? Uh, but it's for an audience that's not a specialist. So again, this is just not for you, Ian, but for people maybe listening or watching for the first time. But I thought um, if you could, Ian, I, very, I know you very well, but if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, if you could, and also and take as long as you want absolutely critical i think for people watching or listening how did you get in to the role that you do now what's your history <laughs> take as long as you like <laughs> so over well, to you ian <laughs> thanks mate uh, it really is a very long story so i will keep it very 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 short uh, i think um i think if there was one small sentence to describe how i get to where i am now it's happy accident um i've never I, I didn't set out in this world to become an engineer i set out to become an illustrator uh at university i i studied technical illustration engineering illustration i think like the haynes manual using a, a pen rotary ink on a pillar paper or vellum uh, and delivering engineering illustrations um, you know that's what i wanted to do but guess what there's no jobs in that anymore and there weren't any when i left university um so uh i sort of accidentally got into engineering through various really odd attacks from uk through new zealand getting into um a uh, civil engineering type world and then back to the uk doing all sorts of cool stuff uh, and then getting a job with what was um uh, moss systems it was soft at the time um, by complete accident really um, uh, i was looking for more work designing highways uh, and doing civil engineering uh, and they were looking for sort of coders and project managers and i think somewhere along the line the wires got crossed and i ended up having an interview with them um, and uh, yeah, a couple of hours later they loved me <laughs> which was about handy really uh, because software paid a hell of a lot more than construction <laughs> So, um, yeah, and, and really having done lots of sort of CDE type work with them, looking at designing it and, and training it and, and helping to, uh, to to get those very basics in the early, uh, I suppose, early 2000s. Um, I had the, the, the real pleasure to be involved in the, um, the UK government's BIM task group uh, and then get involved in the... Um, uh, you know, the, the, the Crossrail BIM Academy, their sort of information management academy, which I think actually opened my eyes to everything, because not only were we uh, talking about standards and how they were practically applied in construction, not just the fact that it's a standard in a very academic way, it's how we actually going to do something on a construction site that's going to give us value. And that's been sort of an underlying theme all the way through my digital and BIM thinking is it's got to have a value. If there isn't, you know, if there isn't money at the bottom end of this, I'm afraid to say, um, you know, why are you doing it? And so we 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 went through that world of doing the academy and then moving forward into other areas, um, and various getting involved in everything and anything I could get my uh, uh, get my teeth into, um, and then ending up where I am now, which is semi-retired, doing a little bit of work with uh, with Bentley. Um, doing a bit of work with the National Digital Twin Programme, which is awesomely exciting. I'm loving it. I really am. Um, and then doing, a, a, you know, just things to help people as and when I go. Um, yeah. the, the thing that has really got me where I am right now was Greg Bentley's um, remit to me uh, when we started the academy, and I've kept it going for the whole time. The whole time for me, it was do the right thing. And that's it. That's the whole remit. Just do the right thing. So if I think the right thing is to um, help the uh, the Thailand government in in restructuring their their BIM digital thinking, 
then I'll, I'll do that and Bentley will support me in my efforts to do that. Or if I think the right thing is going to, um, you know, uh, one of the smaller construction companies and helping them understand a value proposition, then I'll go and do that as well. But the whole thing is, you know, if I think it's the right thing to do for the industry and um, you know, construction as a whole, uh, then go for it and go and do it. So, you know, exciting stuff, but all the things that I've got to to get to where I am right now, I've been happy accidents. <laughs> Great. Th th thanks, Ian. So, so brilliant to have the happy accidents and to, to have met you on your journey and particularly the mm. information management side, obviously. And um, I mean, we all come at it from different ways, don't we? So I've got a different background, but we're in a similar space to some degree. And I find it absolutely fascinating that people with very different backgrounds can think so similar. So um, I, I mean, there's so many things I could uh, talk about with you, but I mean, it, if if I if I could you know start start with the end in mind and all that as as we say mm -hmm. and and maybe just the work that you've done around alignment I know maybe for people that are close to this kind of activity they'll have heard it before but again for people that are new to the concept of alignment as in sort of the outcomes and benefits and just how you go about it I'm particularly referring to obviously the the paper that you wrote through through commit and I know that was that was a very important piece of work because I've read it several times and so thank you for making that sort of freely available. I, I wonder if you could just outline what that was and then maybe some concepts around alignment of outcome yeah. if, if you would. Sure no worries. I think what really struck me right from the very beginning in that sort of the, the BIM and digital world is people were asking for information but they didn't know why they were asking for it and the problem with information of course is it costs money to gather to manage and store, to disseminate, uh, to verify, and all the other things. It's an expensive business. It's also an expensive business when it comes to carbon. If you think of the amount of electricity we use in a, in a large uh, database just to store billions of pieces of data, when actually, what are those pieces of data useful for? Um, and we've got to go right back to the very beginning, and that's what the work was about, was aligning and that um, that line of sight from the individual piece of information that I'm collecting to the original statement by whether it's a project strategy document, a policy document written by a government department, or it might, you know, um, might be one of the, the, the project documents that's, that's been put in for the construction of something. Um, and what we've got to be able to do is we've got to be able to take the statements out of those strategy documents or whatever it might be, work out what they actually mean in plain language, because that's where our plain language comes. We're engineers. We speak in, in like plain, honest language. We don't like this weird gobbledygook of, of, of rubbish that a lot of people come up with. Um, put it in plain language and then work out what are the key things that I need to achieve to, 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 to make that possible, that policy statement, that strategy statement, or whatever it might be, and then work out what information will allow us to measure, monitor, and you know, tick the box to say, yes, I've done that. So I can honestly take a single piece of information and trace that all the way back up to a policy statement in, a, in something, maybe a speech by a politician, which means that that politician in a year's time or two years time can stand up in front of the people that elected and say i achieved what i said i was see this piece of information here shows that i've achieved it and it's all the way through and that reflects in absolutely everything whether you are looking to measure and monitor risk for insurance or for your finances in the project or whether you're looking at contract documents and if you think about um smart contracts digital contracts it's the same sort of thing. It's, it's a list of plain language statements linked to specific pieces of information that can be measured, monitored and assured at the end of it that can say, well, I've achieved this piece of information. So therefore, I've achieved this statement, which means tick, the contract is complete. I can get paid or we can move on to the next bit or it's assured, or whatever it might be. Um, but the problem is we ask for stupid things like Kobe. I'm afraid to say, not a fan at all. People say, oh, I need Kobe. The Kobe can be lots of things. You can put hundreds of pieces of information into a Kobe um, format that are, have no value whatsoever. And if you just ask for something like that, you get a load of 
you get a load of lines. You get some good stuff. You might get some valuable stuff in there. But it's like kind of like just you know, buying a, a box of junk at a, a, an auction. You're going to get 100 pieces of junk in there, but you might get one or two pieces that are really, really good and worth valuable. But you've spent a lot of money on a load of junk otherwise. Um, so what you want to do is make sure you know exactly what you want. And the only way you know what you want information-wise is understanding that bigger, high-level strategy right from the very, very beginning. Um, and so, you know, getting that alignment massively important. And I think that it, it underlines the thing that we were talking about earlier is the value proposition. Because unless you understand the value, uh, why are you buying it? You, <laughs> you're just buying a load of junk. You've got to buy the things that give you value, give your clients value, uh, and give society value as a whole. Otherwise, we're wasting money. Uh, and we're wasting money hand over fist, I'm afraid to say, in a lot of digital areas. Yeah, it's it's a good point about the value because I'll um I'll often well at least play devil's advocate when people talk about for example laser scanning everything or whatever it is I'll say what's the what's the what's the point what's the purpose what's the value um and yeah. I I think it's ironic isn't it that could over delivery of information and data is a is a real risk i think um have you i mean maybe you don't want to name any projects but have you got any examples where you've seen sort of a mismatch of data delivery or information delivery or I, over delivery something like that i i i i, I won't i won't put any names in there sure no please don't. I, I i have seen <laughs> <laughs> so i i have seen several projects where they have laser scan things to millimeter perfect all over and they've spent hundreds of thousands of pounds delivering something that looks absolutely beautiful i mean looks glorious but when you go and deliver that to the um the asset manager uh does it go into the CAFM system oh no have we got a database big enough to store it uh, no okay so we need to get a new system which is on the cloud to host all this data that's great how much is that going to cost us oh dear um you know can we access it you're going to need more software what value is it going to give us mm, well actually the people maintaining that thing well they don't need all that accuracy they just need to know that, that pump is in that room i don't need to know where it is precisely to the millimeter because when i go to redo that room again in the future i'm not going to trust the scan that was done five ten years ago uh, I might not even be able to get access to it because, you know, formats change all the time. But even if I did, I wouldn't trust it. Of course I wouldn't. I'd go and get a rescan myself to do the work because that's the baseline for, for my survey work for, for doing the uh, the work. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, we there are so, so often that we overspec, over egg that um, amount of information. I think what, okay, another box, oh, my apologies. <laughs> <laughs> you know how many times yeah. I jump on these boxes. No, no, it's all good. It's, it's all good. I'm finding there's a lot of consultancies out there which are convincing clients that they need lots of information that they don't, and they need it in a format in which they don't, um, and they're manipulating what they are interpreting those standards to say. Uh, well, actually, what you really need is a way of transferring the information out of the project system into the CAFM system. Uh, or just the information that's required and i think we're we're over egging the standards we're causing a lot of confusion we're taking away a lot of the value which is impacting on the adoption across the industry uh, people don't trust a lot of the things they're doing because they don't see the value um so yeah <laughs> no I, I i so what what, what would you see as I, again, I, I won't put words in your mouth, even though I want to give uh, some articulation. But I won't. What, what do you see as the way out of that? How do, how do we, as a collective industry, how do we move away from that to try and help clients articulate what they need? We've got to get rid of a lot of the gobbledygook and a lot of the uh, the double language. Um, so what do I mean by that? So when the um, I don't know, if some work's been done on this, and some of it's been quite good. But it's still, you know, the, the, the statement of the appointee and the appointer with the appointed and the appointed. Oh, come on. That's not how human beings talk. We need to have something in plain language that tells people 
the right thing to do in the right way with an example of how to do it. Um, I, I, I liken this, uh, I've done this many times, to historically, is in the, in the old days, kind of pre-medieval, the, the Bible was written in, in Latin, okay? And so only the special people could read it because only a few people could read Latin and they would interpret it and they get loads of money for interpreting it and tell the people what was going on. And then somebody came along, I think it was King John, uh, came along and gave everybody a Bible in English. Suddenly everybody could read it. Everybody can interpret it their own way. Everybody can understand what was going on. And so it broke the power of the consultants or the priests. Um, which is what we need to do in our industry, because that power at the moment is crippling what we're trying to deliver. Um, and once we've got something that's simple to read, we need it in one place. Because at the moment, that poor client, no matter who they are, has got to buy five different standards. And then they've got to work out which part of the five different standards is relevant to them and work out how they're going to do it. Oh, come on. Oh, we're making it too difficult for people to do. I know it shouldn't be that difficult to just pick up five standards wrong, but it is. People are inherently lazy. So we've got to make it easy and we've got to really get them to understand where the value proposition is right from the very, very beginning. So simplify for one and then start talking in a language that they understand. When we go to a business leader and talk to them in schemas and noughts and ones and spreadsheets and IT techie stuff, they don't care. They really don't care. We've got to go to them and talk to them in a language, business language. We've got to talk finance. We've got to talk risk. We've got to talk, uh, you know, all that top level of value proposition that they go, oh, OK, well, that makes sense. I need to do that for my business. So let's do some of this BIM digital stuff because it's going to help me make more money to pay the shareholders. Yeah, happy. Let's go. But we're not doing it. We're seriously not doing it. I don't see it at all. <laughs> I, I <clears throat> so I agree with all of your sentiment. Well, careful what I say; it's been recorded. But I, I agree with, <laughs> let's say, the majority. In case there was something you said there that was controversial, but I, I no, I agree. It, it is absolutely the language, and I, it's um. So even having sort of a technology background like myself, I find some of it quite difficult, tricky. Let's mm -hmm. say. Um, so I, I think, you know, certainly it would be challenging if people do not have a background in data technology and um, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a challenge. So so we move people forward by, is it guidance? Is it, what is it? It's, it's providing that plain language, that plain language uh, guides plain, that are missing? Yeah. Plain language guides that speak in business language, not in BIM language or all our mm -hmm. acronyms mm -hmm. and crazy crazy gobbledygook that we, we we talk about yeah. a lot of people push all that aside i want to write yeah. almost get somebody who writes purely in business and financial find a journalist from the financial times and get them to write that because they're going to write in a language that the people who are at the top of those client organizations the financial institutions who are backing each of those constructions or whatever it is or the government institutions that are being backed by various private public uh, purses that um you know language that they can understand and not only language they understand but language that is positive to them rather than something that this guy yeah i don't really understand it's not going to change my world put it to one side carry on doing what we've always done yeah i i'll often well joke but in a serious way about the um communication challenge as well which is there are communication professionals like you've just you've just mentioned journalists <laughs> yeah. i mean or who, who or whomever there are there, there there is a profession called marketing as well i think uh <laughs> and 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 often they're they're missed out aren't they so i completely yeah. agree with you and um yeah a persistent challenge but if i mean it, if you wouldn't mind i know you mentioned digital twins and i know the assumption would be that most people know what that is now but i don't think everyone would would, would you just mind sort of outlining what that is and if, if you can your involvement with with that please? okay so i think we, we we've got to describe three things if we're going to all four things if we're looking at digital twins so um and this is coming from the, the national digital twins sort of um description base as such because we need to get flat level of everybody describing something the same way the problem we've got out there of course is 
that anybody who wants to sell a bit of software or sell a consultancy or sell whatever it is, they go, oh, I'll give you a digital twin. And you go, oh, that's great, that's fantastic. And quite frankly, you're not getting a digital twin at all. So let's start right at the very beginning. A digital model. A digital model is a, uh, a digital representation of a physical thing. Okay, so that could be from scanning, could be databases, could be forms, could be lots of different information about that, that physical thing. But it's a snapshot in time. It just happens at that moment in time. It doesn't move forward, doesn't change. The next level up, we have a digital shadow. Now, digital shadow has a one-way update. So things in the physical will change, and then sensors in that physical update the digital. Okay, so a digital shadow is a that digital representation, but it's constantly updating. Whether that's updating on a daily basis, an hourly basis, a weekly basis, that's semantic. But it is updated, so it's no longer out of um, uh, out of step with the physical. Digital twin comes in many different forms, as such. Now, digital twin has a two-way um, uh, Link. So you're going to have sensors in your physical world that change what the digital does. And then in the digital thing, it will go, well, OK, I'm going to make a decision because the room's too hot and it's going to change the temperature setting, temperature setting in the physical. So you get that, that two way link between the two. But it comes on different forms. One is reactive. So a lot of the things we see at the moment are reactive in the fact that the temperature goes up in the building. The sensor tells the digital that the temperature has gone up. The digital then goes, aha, but the temperature needs to go down. I'll open a window. Actuator in the, uh, the physical world opens the window and it cools it down. Lovely. But what we need is a predictive world better than just purely a reactive world. We want the building to know what the temperature is going to be during the day. So it's detecting, you know, the, the Met Office or whatever it might be. And then it can then go, well, actually, I know the temperature is going to go up during the day. So instead of that temperature sensor getting to a certain point and going, oh, it's way too hot in there, open a window. It's got, why are we getting too hot? Because that's getting us inefficient in that building. We need to make sure that we predict that something's going to happen and be able to mitigate it before it happens. So, you know, true digital twins will do that two-way predictive. A little bit less than that is reactive. Less than that is a digital shadow where we've got a one-way piece of information. And less than that is a digital model where we have just purely, um, you know, a, a digital representation frozen in time. Yeah, Th thanks, Ian. And, and it's that sensor or that feedback loop, isn't it, that I guess mm. is the distinguishing. The, j just to throw it in there, because I was just making notes on it, I just wrote, I just realized I wrote down the word intelligent building and smart building while mm. I was listening. Now, <laughs> I won't ask you to define them, but I, I guess conceptually, in the specific example you gave, that may be mm. synonymous with that. I'm only saying it for people listening and watching because I realize there are whole events sort of smart buildings or yeah. that. Yeah. that is similar on some level to the application, I guess, of the digital yeah. twin. But um, and I don't see why those are, are specifically different. I mean, you know, if you've got a building control system, it's got a digital representation of the building, and it can adjust things inside that building to make them optimal for the workers, for the maintenance, for the operations. For yeah, okay, that's great. I'd be more than happy to 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 put a label on that one. Yeah, it's fine. I, and again, I was, I was just throwing it out there because I was looking at an event the other day, which was smart, I think smart buildings or smart estate. Mm. And I thought, hmm, this sounds familiar. So that I, th I think it's so close. Um, so ag again, obviously, the so the core audience is, is, you know, not necessarily technical data. However, I think we talked about trust and value in the, the first piece that you're talking about. You're talking about yeah. value. And it got me thinking of blockchain. Now, you know, I don't want to throw all these terms out there, but <laughs> what I want to do is to way find people into some of the fundamental things that they probably should be looking up, like digital twin. I mean, what do you think about blockchain? Should sort of the average person be looking that up? Have you got any opinion? Are we not ready yet? Or well, I, I'm I'm not sold on blockchain. 
Um, so having run the, the the commit world for the last 20, pretty almost 20 years or something like that, um, and so commit, sorry, is, is uh, construction innovations program. We've got lots of innovations and cool tech and things like that out there that could make a real significant impact on construction. But the construction industry doesn't do it because it's risk averse, it's conservative, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, so how are we going to get them to spend even more money on something that once again to them is a new innovation that actually nobody is defining the real value proposition? You go, well, you can trust this stuff. Well, hang on a minute. Why can't I trust it in a, in a common data environment or a database I've already got? Why, why do I need to spread it out around the world? Now, what, what's the, you know, that's going to cost me money. That's going to cost us carbon. Am I going to get to net zero by, uh, by doing that? Well, I'm not entirely convinced. Um, somebody's going to have to do some real solid work on a value proposition for it in construction. And we can't just go down the line of, oh, that means everybody can trust the data. Well, supposedly, we should be able to trust all the data in a common data environment already. And yet a good percentage of the construction industry can't be bothered to have one or doesn't see the value in one. So why are they going to go at even more and get what value? I don't know yet. So I, I don't think it's relevant in our world yet. I think maybe in five, ten years time and all the, the crazy stuff that we're talking about is just um, common practice stuff we do every day anyway without even thinking about it. Um, or to a point where we have some sort of digital pandemic, God knows what that might be, where it means that we can't trust any of the data in any of our systems. And we're going to have to find a solution to that. But I think in time, um, yeah, I, I would I would park that in the, the 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 area of don't worry about it at the moment. It'll hit us when it hits us. It'll hit. Us. So so th thank you for that. So um, <laughs> I guess conversely, then what are the say one or two things that people should look out for if if I'm in construction and I'm maybe not a full time digital person, for example. What 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 are the sort of emergent or ones to watch at the moment that might be new to people not so close to these things i think it's it's it's, it's all down to the information world no matter how you um uh, how you you deal with that information you've got to have a good way of collecting it and you've got to have a way of collecting it without adding extra onus value um, sorry onus cost uh, risk anything to, to to your people it's got to be something they do all the time um, and something that is just um become second nature you don't add to their burden but you've got to spin it in the right way um we have this kind of sort of issues right at the very beginning of the the drone world within the, the commit world is the fact that you talk to a surveyor and go oh we're just gonna we're gonna survey the site with a the drone they go oh hang on a minute we're taking my job away from me ah oh, no we're not what we're gonna do is make sure you can do it faster so then you can spend the rest of the day either at home or in the office with a sandwich and a cup of tea or you don't actually have to go out on site at all because you can do it all remotely. Oh, oh, hang on a minute. So we've got to we've got to kind of like put it in the right way. You can, you can do it safer because you're not putting a human being in a risk uh, environment. You've got to spin these things in the right way. Um, so being able to uh, collect information, manage information as um, it's just what happens is really important, and working out how to to utilize it. But I suppose before we do all of that, we've got to work out what is valuable in the information world in the first place. Uh, what decisions do you need to make and what information do you need to make those decisions? And how would you like that information presented to you? Do you want a video? Do you want a VR file? Do you want a bit of data on a screen? Do you want a paper document? What do you want? How can I make it easy for you? Because you are the person on site doing the job and I want to make your job as easy as possible and risk-free as possible yeah and i i think obviously the the subtext to a lot of these things is about the, the process and i know we, maybe we haven't said that word directly but i mean that that's obviously absolutely it isn't it it's mm. like how might the process or processes be changed and modernized and i um I, again i don't know if there's any examples you can 
share or anything to allude to where so you've seen process improvements or, or oh, good case studies? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of the really early commit uh, projects, Stuart Young was was working on this one. Um, and it's, it's actually got a bit of a, a kick in its tail. So it was a, a load of um, inspectors on sort of highway jobs. Um, uh, and they go in on a Friday, they did all their inspection stuff for the, for the following week, and they put all their reports in. They'd all sit around, have a cup of tea, have a chat, whilst they were putting their expenses and everything in. They'd all get together. Then they deployed a fantastic new mobile system that they don't have to go back to the office. So instead of going at paperwork, they could just do it straight in front of them. They could put the reports in without having to write it up afterwards. So, um, you know, productivity exponentially straight through the roof. Fantastic. Lots of things going on. Brilliant. And then the productivity sort of topped off and then it just nosedived. Why? Well, people didn't talk to each other. So if you've got a load of people in one room, not only do they talk about normal stuff, but they also talk about their work because there's like minded people and they go, oh, I had this problem on this site and this is how I solved it. And everybody else listens and go, oh, yeah, I've got that problem. I'll solve it that way as well. But instead of one person solving it, talking about it, and everybody following suit, you've now got a, you know, 30, 40 inspectors solving the same problem 30, 40 times. So productivity just goes through the, uh, through the floor because people aren't communicating and talking. So whilst we want to improve processes and improve productivity through digital means, we can never discount human beings and the fact that human beings need to talk to each other, not in like this over a, a camera. They need to talk to each other face to face properly in, in, a, in a human environment, because that's where the really useful conversations go. And, you know, our useful conversations we've had in the past always been over a, a coffee or a beer or something like that. Something pops into your brain. You go, oh, yeah, mate, got to tell you about this. And suddenly you find out something that's impacting your life as well. And you start sharing these things. Mm. And I think COVID has sort of underlined that quite dramatically. Whereas people working from home, productivity straight up through the roof. Brilliant. Fantastic. And then we stop talking to each other because we only talk to each other because I want to ask you a question. It was transactional. We just asked the question, killed the, killed the, uh, the, the, the call. Instead of just meeting up at the coffee machine or the beer or whatever it is, and what have you been up to today? Oh, well, this is what I've been doing. Oh, that's really interesting because that impacts on what I'm doing. And the conversation goes on. So we've got to find a way of socialising people as well as digitising people. Wow. Yeah, it's a really good point. It's a really good point because often I think um, of knowledge management, however we define that, which is, but I mean, you're obviously you're talking something beyond that i mean that's obviously mm. that social aspect I, I i still think there's sort of a, a click under that if you like the actual turning the tacit knowledge into structured knowledge i i don't i, I know you didn't that wasn't the point you were making but just maybe on that theme because it's sort of related mm. to knowledge management have you got have you got anything to, to add around knowledge management or um i think, I think we're pretty poor at it <laughs> we are really poor at it especially when it comes to, to lessons learned I mean, you look at the uh, the Crossrail legacy site, the, the lessons learned site. It's fantastic. Loads of really good information on it. Um, and also the kind, some of the lessons learned as a whole, people were willing to share those lessons. Yet there's a good proportion in our industry who are very, very willing to ignore those lessons and go off and make the same mistakes all over again because they didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to learn it. But, you know, it's all out there, that kind of knowledge, but we don't, I don't think we, we disseminate it properly. We don't socialize it properly um, and allow people to, I mean, you want people to, to, to learn lessons through mistakes. You, you've got to make sure people don't mind too much about making a mistake. But if it's something that's being made over and over and over and over again, and it's not being recorded and the knowledge isn't being um, put down there and, and, you know, being exchanged, then we've got a real problem with um, you know, industry as a whole. On and I see that on a lot of the big major projects where we need to share the knowledge that we've gained 
but also we've got to listen to the knowledge came from other people. So it's all very well, you know, being on broadcast, which I'm afraid to say, sometimes I am on broadcast mode all the time when I stand on my, my soapbox and I rant. But I think most people who know me will know that actually I can sit here and listen for a couple of hours as well. Um, and that is massively important to listen and learn what everybody else has been uh, going through. It's a really good point, Ian. I know um, when I spoke with Malcolm Taylor, he obviously mentioned the Crossrail legacy uh, site as well, which, which, and of course I know it because, as you know, my background's somewhat in rail. But um, I, I, I wonder who would know outside rail. You know, I, th I think there's, again, I'm just sort of speaking aloud here, but I think, do you do you see that as a challenge cross sector? Because um, I guess we're implying within the sector, but what what are your thoughts about how we could improve cross sector sort of um, communications? Uh, Have you got any thoughts on how we can do improve that? Well, well, I've got to say we did uh, all those years in the academy. We had all those wonderful lessons that we learned in cross rail and also in UK industry as a whole. That people came from all over the world into the london environment for us to talk about what was going on we didn't talk necessarily about software or, or specifics but what we were doing is we were sharing all those lessons and little bits of best practice little bits of good practice uh, and getting people to understand that and within the i think it was the um we ran for about nine years before it was closed down um uh, within that time we had around about I think it was about 12,000 people worldwide from, I think they came from about 50 different countries. Uh, I can't even name all the countries. Um, but they would fly into London just to hear from Malcolm and to hear from me and to hear from some of the crossfire guys and to learn that knowledge. And it was people that came from oil and gas, they came from power industry, they came from mining. Um, you know, we had those honest conversations. And I think that's. In a way, we've lost that completely, is that ability to have honest conversations which don't cost anything apart from the time taken to be in that room. Yeah, it's, it's difficult. Sorry, go on, you were going to add something. I was going to say, and, and some of those organisations will invest serious amounts of money in, in being in that room. We had uh, one big major construction organisation that came in, um, they were originally, initially just come in for about four hours to talk and they had lots of Big bosses flown in from all over the world in there um and after four hours it was kind of like we're not going we haven't made our decisions yet so they stayed for that whole day and into the evening as well we ended up talking solidly for nine hours um and we worked out that particular construction company would have had to have pulled down about 10 million pounds worth of business to have those people in that room for that day which is kind of like wow that's yeah. just insane but that's the investment level they wanted to learn from the other sectors they wanted to learn what was going on from uk government what other people have been doing around the world how can you get that together and get some advice and i think we've lost that capability right now of delivering good honest free advice um that is pretty impartial um I don't think I don't see it out there at the moment. Uh, there are lots of different organisations that you can join and you can sit in on meetings and things like that. But actually, they're very either specific to a single topic or a sector or they're a BIM4 group or whatever it might be. Um, you need something much more holistic, much more top level talking to management and value proposition and all the stuff we're talking about now. Um, you know, I, you know I, I, I hop back to the days of that academy. Um, best, best years of my life in there. They really were. It was so exciting to be, uh, to watch people in that room. And they come in, they're kind of like, oh, yeah, the digital, yeah, for, for, nothing to do with me. And they sit there, they're kind of like, oh, follow, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And they'd be kind of like, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, hmm, it's quite interesting. You mean, I can make more money or I can be safer on the construction site or I can be more efficient or I can productivity. And then suddenly they're, they're, they're banging the table and why aren't we doing this? It was great. I loved it. It was so good. 
I, yeah, I, I just feel so, <laughs> it was so happy those days in the academy doing stuff like that. Um, yeah, but there you go. Those but, days are uh, gone now. <laughs> well, maybe there's no opportunity. Maybe there's a gap to be filled there still. I mean, the, the challenges haven't gone away. If anything, no. things are busier as in potentially even more tricky to navigate now as far as what all the different digital initiatives there was even just mm. last week i was speaking to someone they're asking me how do i get people interested in digital i'm paraphrasing obviously and uh, i mm. said well don't talk about digital is the first one exactly. <laughs> that's yeah. literally what i said word for word and you think because because like you're saying if digital or information management or whatever it is or, or bim is the solution what is the problem if you like and i think yeah. I know I'm just paraphrasing what what you're saying because you're you're you know that you are you personify the kind of concepts I try and do. It's like pe people don't talk about the business challenge because they're not there. I think there is an element without getting too deep of tribalism as well. Would you agree with that? People in different camps, oh, how they identify, hugely so. Um, if your if your face doesn't fit, and if you aren't one of those, and I know. A lot of those organizations work very very hard to try and incorporate lots of things but if you're not one of those specific people then you're never really going to make an impact or a difference in that world um uh you know i there are some people who've done some incredible stuff over these years and i i do take my hat off to the dedication that they have had the amount of time effort blood sweat and tears that they put in but i don't necessarily feel that it's a joined up um deliverable i think there's lots of different camps lots of different people going in lots of different directions um and as we sort of uh, talked about earlier you need the condor from the top down rather than from the bottom up otherwise you get the kind of the problems we have in things like uniclass at the moment you've got 50 different doors in uniclass that's because some brilliant well um you know well-intentioned expert who's good at doors did the doors i don't want top 50 doors i want from the top down starting from you know rail what's below rail well a station a depot a railway line is below de that right okay what's below the station well it's the platform it's the well and go all the way down from the bottom rather than starting on oh i've got a plastic window i've got a wet metal window i've got a wooden window i've got a white window i've got a black window i've got a green window oh come on you know i can't do that bit down the bottom because we get fragmented it's all well meaning there's lots of good stuff in there but we're going to start from the top down which is you know when we go back to this stuff we talked about right in the very beginning the alignment stuff You've got to start with a high level strategy before you bring it down to a plain language statement or question or outcome. Well, then you bring it down and focus again to individual pieces of information that are going to help you achieve those things. So you get from the top down to the bottom. If you start at the bottom, you're never going to get to the top. But if you start at the top, you can see all the way down. Yes, I'm completely with you. I it, it's it's very interesting, isn't it? People only know what they know. I think that's it, yeah. isn't it? You know, your people are by definition, whether it's engineering or whatever it is, people by definition specialize, and it could be their life's work. No doubt yeah. it is if they're a career in. And I think I think it is a challenge. I mean, what? Um, just asking you because because uh, it'll actually benefit something I'm working on at the moment. So I'll ask you what would, be... <laughs> but aligned aligned with the thought process of ISO fifty five thousand series for people mm -hmm. that don't know what that is. That's strategic asset management. What 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 do, what do you think the message should be for governments at whole government level for a portfolio level? Because I, I think that's another as in government property type level. So so again, it's not necessarily using the word engineering, but you know that that can be challenging my, myself to say well actually at an operational level so for example rail in my case i know i know all the well i know most of the case studies it's an irrefutably good story to do with safety no doubt and also cost is in there at some point but i think yeah. you go up a higher level i mean have you got any insights about what so for example in a treasury or at a policy level at the policy the level above the de the department what what is what do we say? How do we how do we sell it into people that the only write policies, for example, that don't have a tactical or an operational asset experience? What what, what do we say? Well, I think it is 
going back to that value proposition again you've got to understand what is valuable in running that that thing that operation how do we know that the operation has achieved its goals because you might have something really high level in the fact that we need to get four million people in and out of london in a day great that's the top level statement that we need to go from so how are we going to measure how many people go in and out of London every day, right? We've got to do that on, on, on ticket barriers or however we're going to do it or through security cameras. Right, okay, fantastic. So what have we got to put in place to do? And we just keep going down until we know just the information that will do our policies. So this is something, uh, another topic altogether, I suppose, is that interoperability study, okay? Um, when we look at interoperability on a on a national scale, on a on a you know a cross sector scale, there's very few bits of information that I actually need to share between the rail industry and the road industry, because it's the interfaces. You know the the station is there, um, or the bridge going over the road is there, but the rest of it, I don't care what number platform you've got, or the fact that you've got X number of kilovolts going through something or other, or um, you know. I don't really care. All I care about is the bits that impact me. And those are the bits we need to be interoperable with. And those are the value propositions when we're on a much higher level. It's purely the information that allows me to run the road and the rail next to each other um, uh, efficiently and optimized. So when you throw the rest in, when you've got the power and you've got the water and you've got the communications and the medical, um, you've got the ports, you've got the airfield, you know, everything else, how do they? impact and relate to each other and what information do each one of those have to share to give us that value and when you worked out that piece you know it's probably only about one percent of the value of the information that the railway station or the bridge or whatever it is holds I only want one percent i don't care about the rest the rest really is down between you as the client and the contractor that delivered it to you that's fine you you carry on with that bit I need to know the bigger picture of the incorporated space between the various sectors. And that allows me to run the country much more efficiently and strategically, because then I know where my criticalities are. I know where my vulnerabilities are. I know where I need to build new industry because I've got capacity in the power grid or new housing because I've got capacity in my schools or in my roads or um, where I need to put a, a new power station because that's the bit that moment i want to develop certain things so i've got strategy into the future or potentially if there's a disaster coming you know um we are as a, as a nation very much close to the sea we are beholden to floods and heavy rain um so if i can understand the information around my assets within that certain area, but I only need a little bit of information to be shared between the various organizations, um, which will allow me to make a really good decision if there's a flood or if there's an earthquake or if there's a, you know um, some sort of storm or a civil unrest uh, that allows me to carry society on into the future. So I think you know that value proposition right at the very, very top um, is, working out what is useful what has value between organizations defining that and just sharing that one or two percent of data not trying to share everything i don't want to create uh, a bun why would i share all the data about my asset with you there's no need you don't want to know and i don't want to share it with you <laughs> so why not just share with me where my electricity comes from or they can share where my water comes from um, it might be pipe size it might be how much capacity is left in the pipe um, it might be is it overground or underground so i understand whether it's going to get hit by a flood or uh, high winds um, but just that basic five or six pieces of information will deliver nationally a huge amount of value thanks ian that's i mean that's amazing oh, because i i know no that's really good and i and i I think that sort of like you're saying common thread or just enough information to make to make that and you talked mm -hmm. about inter interfaces I think that's the other key thing reminds me sort of where GIS it doesn't have to obviously be be mapped but but have you got anything to say about GIS's I can't I can't move on without that <laughs> no well no I, I think it's absolutely fantastic you know GIS I think was the almost the original BME type 
digital world uh, in the fact that it had a, an interface, it had data behind it, it had layers and levels, and it was able to share information back. So, and really, we sort of kind of like, oh, but it frustrated me that we just kind of like sidelined the GIS people and, and just kind of tried to work our own stuff, whereas there are already standards available, there are already experts in those kind of areas. Um, but I think, you know, the, the GIS is something that will help us, the GIS world will help us a lot when we're looking at those cross-sector uh, interdependencies between things and not just on things I'll, I'll leave you with this thought putting people into that world as well okay because I can't just understand about where my road rail power water comms medical whatever it is I need to understand where my critical people are as well because during the pandemic we learned that there might have been certain people in industry that was the only person who had the key or had the formula or could work this particular thing. I suppose that goes back to your knowledge exchange argument we had earlier. We don't record any of that. So I need to know where that person is, how vulnerable that person is, and how I could potentially get them out of a disaster area and put them into the area that makes them uh, have the ability to run that power station, which provides power to the 100,000 people nearby and the ventilators at the hospital and all the other stuff that we need to have. Uh, because you've got you know, people who are critical, but you also have people who are vulnerable in our society. How would you put them into that? So if there's a disaster, I've now got enough information to go, right, well, these 16 people in this area, I need to go and make sure they've got bottled water. I need to make sure they've got medical uh, attention. I need to uh, make sure they've got a portable generator, to give them heat because they can't do stuff for themselves. Um, you know, all this kind of stuff uh, helps us to make better decisions for society. And, you know, we're infrastructure people. What is infrastructure all about? It's about supporting society and making the world a better place for everybody. You know. Uh, it, to, to coin the phrase from the uh, from the Hot Fuzz film, it's the greater good. <laughs> and it and it is it is true. Thank you. I mean, we're we're, we're coming toward the end of our our time, and um, I I just to ask you straight up, but the United Nations Sustainability De Development Goals do they hmm. are they discussed in in your work or by? I guess I'm I, I know you know what they are, but I'm I, I guess I'm asking: Do your clients or people that you work with do they are they familiar with them? Do you see them out there quite a lot, or not really? They they are, and they they are worried about the sustainability goals. They're worried about uh, net zero as we come into the future. Um, you know, there's a lot of concern over that. Um, I suppose some of the uh, bringing it around to kind of that, that power bit, the net zero bit, is quite a, a good example. When we're talking about that uh, that world where everything is connected, the problem we have at the moment is understanding what your your carbon footprint is. You know, we you know what yours is, but then the the, the things that supply you and the things that supply them, um, it's very difficult to map what they are. But if you've got this mapped cross sector world, um, so imagine if you will, so we're going to national digital twin world here. Okay, imagine a circuit board. Okay, imagine a big circuit board. Imagine each of those buildings and facilities and everything that we talked about um, as a chip, chip of data. And I plug the chips into the circuit board so I can see the connections between them all. Okay, so I've got all those um, those connections. So if I want to understand um, the, uh, the the carbon footprint of my thing, I understand actually because i know the connections between the next thing and the next thing and the next thing and the next thing all the way up the line because it might be the fact that you know i'm talking about um uh, uh a wastewater treatment works here but actually that needs power from over there and the power comes in via the port because it's oil or it's whatever fired but actually the port relies on the uh the railway system and the railway system relies on the electricity generation the generation flies on etc et and the communications network because that tells it whether to switch on and off so everything relies on each other but each of them obviously generates um a carbon footprint and to understand where all your carbon is generated from top to bottom uh, is a massively difficult task. But if you know those connections and know those interdependencies and know how much of that capacity you are 
personally responsible for, your, your thing is personally responsible for, then you can really start to understand how you can drive it down to uh, the net zero world. Because uh, at the moment, we can, we, we can grab a, a figure from space, but actually that's not good enough. Um, we, we need to start driving it right to the bottom because climate, as we all know, uh, we're experiencing that in the UK. You know, how warm is it at the moment compared to other winters? Yeah. Flowers are still out in the garden. The grass is still growing. Uh, it's still warm enough to wander around in shorts out there. Uh, and of course, if you're a post worker, you're, you're always wandering around in your shorts. But for, for normal human beings like me, I'm still in my shorts for walking the dog. It's just, quite frankly, it's scary. The climate has changed that quickly in my lifetime. Um, if we continue to ignore our net zero and our, our carbon footprints and our sustainability work, how quickly is that slope going to go down? Uh, mm. And how much more impact are we going to get? Flooding? Are we going to get more extreme weather events? Um, what's going to happen? I, I don't know. And I'm scared. So yeah. I really am scared what the future is for the next generation. And I, th I think as we gather more information and we talked about digital twins and modelling in, in the various co connotations of what we mean by that, at least we can look at what's likely to happen, you know, multiple mitigations. But I, I like the analogy you gave of a circuit board that reminds me of sort of the embedded carbon. I've I've not heard it in, the, in that way before. That makes sense to me um yeah. so you know if you think about all those sort of facilities they're digital twins or models or shadows as a, as a chip it, you know there's loads of data from databases from systems from servers from websites all sorts of things but if you imagine it as that chip i need to make a decision i've got a circuit board there i make a decision i plug this the chips in that i need i can make my decision and then i can blow it away afterwards because i don't want to own that information God, no, that'd be that'd be shocking. You wouldn't want to store it in two different places. I want that client to carry on owning that data, doing whatever they need to do, it, updating it, uh, quality assuring it, whatever they need to do with it. But just to plug the chip in with one or two pieces of exposed information, don't need loads of it. At the moment, point that I need to make a decision, um, that I need to, 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 to work out what I need to do next, um, or make a strategy or whatever it might be. Um, and then I can blow it away again afterwards. I just keep recreating uh, every time. Yeah, and and of of course, I'm thinking when you say that, I'm thinking of web services or da yeah. data. I mean, I, again, I'm jumping down into how it's applied. I'm just throwing it out there. I might send a link. So I I probably have had all your time. Thanks, Ian. I, just mm. before we conclude, so thank you very much indeed. Fantastic topics, and we hadn't rehearsed this for the benefit of people listening or watching so exactly on the money i mean perfect so i i just wondered if there's i mean there's probably a hundred but just maybe there's a few either websites or resources or events that you might recommend people to, to look at just to read more on where, where would you recommend i don't know top three or something websites for people to learn a bit more about what you've okay. touched on so uh, if you want something really quick and easy for subcontractors and for the bottom end of the of the construction market okay not the, the the main contractors people like that go and look on youtube and look for the sunbelt videos so sunbelt are the people that supply um uh, temporary works you know cherry pickers jcbs and all that kind of wonderful stuff uh, they've got a really good series of 30 second, 60 second, uh, two minute videos, which just explains the value proposition on BIM and digital and what the, you know, a digital model shadow uh, twin and national digital twin are cracking set. Um, you'll, you'll find the author was was amazingly handsome and very, very humble. Um, <laughs> And it, and it wasn't me, by the way. People, oh, no, no, of course not. No, I no. guess it was. Obviously, I will link to these as well, Ian, so, yeah, people can find <laughs> out. Yeah. Um, the other one, uh, you know, the, the Commit website, which we're going to be doing up um, uh, running at some point soon, I all the lessons learned that I have from the Academy over the last 10 years or so, I distilled, I distilled into a book, uh, and that sort of got published, uh, and then during the pandemic, they sort of ran out of paper in india and so it just got shelved um but most of that information is available up on the commit website in the bim bit we are going to be revamping it in the new year 
but um, it's up there in its most basic form um, if you want to, to, to come up and have a, have, a, have a dabble through. All the papers and things on those information requirements, you know, the one you were talking about earlier, uh, and things about, um, uh, yeah, all sorts of topics are up there for, for anybody just to download and use. That was the key thing about all that stuff was I didn't want to put it behind any sort of paywall or advertising or anything like that. People just need to be able to read something written in plain language that they can just they can understand it's there. And if they need to contact me and ask questions about it, all the details are there to do so, and I'll get back to them. Great. Thank you, Ian. I will, of course, link to everything you just mentioned there. And um, it's been great. So thank you. I could talk all day, but I better end it there. But to honour the time that I said I'd be with you. So thank you very much, Ian Miskinnon, for your time and your insight. Thank you very much indeed. No worries. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.